Hey, what's up, everybody? Rob Gill. Um, you know, what's always interesting is when you begin to travel in circles where you're forced, in all good ways, to elevate and increase the base camp, you every once in a while come across someone or something that is just out of this world extraordinary. And today, my guest is Dolph DeRoos. What's up, Dolph? Hey there, How good to see you, brother. Rob? I'm happy, thank you. And Dolph is, um, he's, he's written 23 books. He's lived in seven countries. Presidents around the world continue to call him. He's done work with Robert Kiyosaki, Tony Robbins, uh, the likes of Sean Callagy, as well as Chris Krohn. And his new elevation and his new base camp increase, keeping up with the technological advances of today's society, is incredible. And his next phase is right upon us as we speak including his book that's that's recently been released if you if you want to share the book to the Yeah, it's got the is. longest title on Amazon, I believe. It's called 101 ways to massively increase the value of your real estate without spending much money. Wow. Massively increase the value of your real estate without spending much money. And for the folks that want to be able to see the book, uh, they could just go to TikTok, right? And they could just go right. to go king. to my channel on TikTok, the Commercial Real Estate King or King of Commercial Real Estate. And uh, you'll have a link there where you can get a free copy of the book, in fact. Yes, King of Real Estate, King of Commercial Real Estate, link in his bio. It'll take you through the system and you get a free copy of the book for anyone that's out there that really wants to learn how to massively accelerate in the space of commercial real estate. And we're talking massively, Rob, because there's one idea in this book where we took $20 and turned it into $2 million overnight. Now, I know many people think that's impossible. He's exaggerating. So let me give a more relatable example first. And that is... If you see a house that is in such a bad state of repair, the paint has flaked off most of the window sills and the walls, it doesn't look in a very good condition. Yep. You can paint that house. If you do it yourself, it'll probably cost you $1,000 in paint, and maybe you need to buy a ladder or two, and you can spend a weekend painting that house for $1,000. But the value of the house, its ability to be sold, will probably go up by $20,000. Mm. And my contention is, if you have never spent a weekend and $1,000 making yourself a $19,000 profit, then you should look at changing what you do on weekends. Stop partying, (laughs) stop going to nightclubs, stop going on the chase, and make $19,000 in a weekend. Yes, listen, I think that's a great idea. And it's funny because we were privately speaking off camera, and you were talking about how to look for it. It doesn't just show up at your front door. There's no there's no like, hey, come get success. I'm going to give it to you. Right. you got to research it. But you were talking about a commercial building, hypothetically speaking, and um, it would be valued at a certain amount. And because the loan to value is different in the space of commercial real estate, one of the niches that you've created was to say, okay, and I forget the term that you called it, but hey, if I was to buy this building and put it in a Starbucks, what would happen to the building? I thought that was a great story. And to share it with these folks, it's, it's sure. worthwhile so information. In, in essence, everyone's familiar with the concept of buying a home, probably because most people have bought a home at some stage to live in. And we all know that banks tend to have a loan to value ratio that is about 80%. In other words, if the house costs $100,000, it's pretty hard to get a $100,000 house today. But for a $100,000 home, the bank will lend you about $80,000, which means you need to come up with 20000 in cash. Sometimes banks lend more, but then you need PMI, personal mortgage insurance and the like. So typically we have to come up with a down payment of 20%. When people inquire about commercial real Mm. estate, they say, here's the challenge. Banks typically only lend 50 or if you're lucky, 60% of the value of a building. So the loan to value ratio is lower. That means you need a greater proportion in cash. And many people think that commercial buildings tend to be more expensive than residential. So you have to buy a $2 million building. If the bank only lends you 50%, you've got to come up with a million bucks cash. Most people don't have that lying around. So they say they can't do it. It's too difficult. Mm. But here's something they forget, Rob, and it's a really fascinating point. When it comes to residential property, the value of a home is based on comps. What I mean by that is if you're looking at a three-bedroom, two-bathroom home that might be, you know, 2,000 square feet, it's a certain age, certain condition, has a certain view, the value of that home is going to be almost identical to a similar three-bedroom, two-bathroom home, similar size, similar age, similar condition, similar view that's up the street or down the street or across the road. In other words, the value is determined by the market. And it doesn't even matter whether that house is tenanted or not, whether it's used as a rental or not. 
You might even be able to argue that it's slightly easier for that house to be sold if it's vacant because if the buyer is potentially an owner-occupant, they don't need to get rid of the tenant. But in essence, the value of that home is determined by the market. And we're still talking about, commer not commercial, but we're talking about residential real estate. Correct. Right? Okay. Residential. Excellent. But He's on it, fire right now. When, when it comes, this is just normal. You this is fire, straight it. fire. When it comes to commercial property, and this is really interesting, the value of a commercial property is a multiple of its income. Mm. To be more technically Go Accurate. Go do me a favor because I've yes. heard you say this. Now I want to be the student. Can okay. You please go from now. Go. I got everything with the residential. Okay. Let's go real slow. And I know this kind of played into the teleport and everything else. Okay. Let's go real slow. I'll speak more slow. This is this is where the magic is going to happen. The value of a commercial building is a multiple of its rental income. Mm. If that multiple is ten. And the income from that building, the rental income from that commercial building is, say, $100,000. Then with a multiple of 10, that means the building is worth a million. That's how they value the building. That's the how they value it. So it is based on the rental income of the commercial real estate. Correct. To be technically not correct. Not comps. Got it. To be technically correct, it's the rental income divided by the cap rate. Cap rate is short for capitalization rate. It literally means the rate at which you capitalize the rental income to arrive at the value. Can I ask a silly question? Well, you're interrupting, but yeah, sure. Yes, I apologize. So in a time when residential real estate is climbing because of supply and demand, right? it sounds like to me, as long as people are paying rents and rents tend to increase, commercial real estate is on a different scale as far as going up or down versus residential and sometimes they're not congruent is that is that fair correct sometimes okay. there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between increases in residential values compared with increases in commercial values got it are we in that space and time right now in um, 2021 there are always opportunities and right now i think it's fair to say that the perception is residential has risen all around the world all throughout the western world it's gone up enormously from june 2020 to june 2021 here in the u.s it went up an average of 31 percent oh my goodness and we're not even the fastest growth country in the world some countries have grown faster than that. australia and new zealand have had massive increases wow. and commercial has lagged behind a bit Okay. But there are reasons why I believe that that actually works in the favor of commercial real estate investors. Because I think we all agree the demand for office space has fallen off with COVID. People yep. are working from home a lot more. And some have decided that they actually like working from home. Absolutely. And some employers have decided they don't like renting office space at millions of dollars a year and filling these offices with people who could otherwise happily work from home. But yeah, New York City, I've seen that tremendous pullback in New York City just based on what you're talking about. Right. So the value of some commercial space has plummeted. So what happens to that going forward? Well smart people like you end up buying that and converting it to apartments or converting it to a different use. Uh. Hotels have fallen by the wayside because they couldn't get guests to stay there because of COVID. And they were bought for pennies on the dollar and converted to assisted living facilities. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. And so that's happening right now? It's happening right now. Okay. You've always got to think, what alternative use do we have for the space? Yes. And who right now is taking full advantage of that? You, is there people in this world right now that are really Today, of... it's me, and tomorrow, it'll be you and I. Excellent. It's as soon as people become aware of it that they start to think, hmm, how can I participate in this? So getting back to the point, because yeah. this is really crucial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm highlighted listening. why it's crucial. Yep. The value of a commercial building is a multiple of its rental income. Yes. So if the rental income is low, the value is low. So let's say we have a hotel building. Yeah. Was... And it's generating a million a year in income. Yep. And let's assume cap rates are 10%. Yep. Usually they're not, they're a bit lower, but 10% is an easy number because then the multiple is 10. Yep. So a hotel building generating a million a year is worth about $10 million. Yep. Yep. But imagine it's only at 30% occupancy and that mm. million dollars rental income doesn't cover all their costs of loan servicing and whatnot. And we buy that building for a million, not because we hope to turn it into a profitable enterprise as a hotel, but we know that there's massive demand for assisted living facilities. The population of the U.S. is increasing. That's why residential values have gone up. But this so is an important point. People. The population of people over the age of 65 yes. is increasing at an even faster rate. The that baby means boomers. Anything that caters to the elderly is going to have an increase in demand over and beyond just the increase in population. So, wow, I feel like you just dropped some serious nuggets right now. If people were to look back at this video 10 years from now, what you just said based on the baby boomers age at 65 
and over every single day, 10,000 of them get to that 10, place in time every single day for the next, let's say, 15 or 16 years. Yeah. What well, you're basically saying, ready, because of COVID, because the rules of the game changed when it came to these big uh, piece of property in cities where, you know, there was office buildings, everything else. Right. Turning these type of office buildings and or motels or hotels into assisted living to keep up with the demographics of the folks that are in that baby boom generation is a home run waiting for happen as long as you're out there and you can listen to it. Right. And this is happening and it's going to happen for the next 30 years. At that stage, there'll be a fall off in the number of old people reaching retirement age. Yep. It's already happened in Japan. Japan's got a massively declining population. China is going to enter a phase of a massively declining population. Mm. But here in the States, we're 34 years away from that at this stage. Demographics. Demographics. Wow, that's incredible. It so, is. So now what you're saying is, or I think what you're saying is when we talk about commercial real estate, and then you know, obviously if you found the building, you looked at, let's call it the rent roll, right? right. And now you're like, wait a minute, if we have this local uh, coffee shop or thrift shop, why don't we replace it with a Starbucks? Right. So that gives you the ability to, to go back to the bank and have a different conversation when it comes to the value. Right? Exactly. Okay. So there's, you know, not all commercial buildings are in the millions. Of Let's say there's a building around the corner here for $100,000. And the tenant is, as you suggested, a thrift shop. Yep. And they're paying $12 a foot. Yep. Nothing right or wrong about that. They're serving a good purpose. But we can't afford to buy that building at 100000 because we don't have 100000 In fact, we don't have any cash. Yeah. How can we still take it down? Well, let's say we do some research and find out that the thrift shop is not doing that well and the people running it are going for retirement anyway. And we make some inquiries and we find that there's a coffee shop that wants to occupy that space mm. it could be one of the big brand names i don't want to mention any in sure. case it seems as false advertising yeah we're not I'm, ma- we're just having an open conversation i'm quite partial yeah. to a caffeinated society so um we find that there's a coffee shop that will go in there at 24 or 26 dollars a foot and sign a long-term lease and sign a long-term lease yes. of course so now the rental has doubled and as i was saying before the value of a building is a multiple of its income Amazing. if we double the rental we've doubled the value mm. so now instead of being worth a hundred thousand it's worth two hundred thousand I, I kind of feel like that's the secret that a lot of people just don't know. It's the secret when it comes that to commercial I've used real estate. over and over again to make money. It's how I've made most of my money in commercial wow. real estate. And, and so this building now is worth two hundred thousand. The bank says, "Well, we'll only give you a fifty percent loan." Well, we don't care because fifty percent of two hundred thousand is the hundred thousand dollar purchase price. Yes. Yes. Now, it's not quite that simple. I know there'll be some people saying, hang on a minute, Dolph, that's not quite true because the banks take the lesser of the purchase price or the registered valuation or appraisal. Mm. And on the surface, that's true. But that's only true on one particular day because if we get deferred settlement for three months and we don't close for three months and in the meantime, we've got our tenant and we can go to the bank and say, Mr. Bank Manager, we know that you accept the lower of the purchase price or the registered appraisal. And we fully admit that we only paid $100,000 for this building, but that was then. That was three months ago in this COVID area. That's like a lifetime ago. Mm. That's when there was a thrift shop there paying $12 a foot. And we've now got such and such caffeine company paying $24 a foot. It's worth $200,000 as evidenced by your own ultra conservative bank approved appraiser. And does this also go back to like your relationship with the bank as well? Like if there's a good relationship and your ability to communicate. communicate. And with influence mastery, right? We influence talk about mastery. Self influence. It's, it's so important. If you go to the bank the way most people do, and by the way, the biggest fear they in the world. Mother may I instead the of biggest a fear in the world you'd think is the fear of some untimely death or horrid disease. The biggest fear in the world is the fear of public speaking. And somebody saying no. And the second biggest fear in the world is the fear of going to the bank to ask for money. Yeah. And most people subconsciously go in there, cap in hand, saying, Mr. Bank Manager, yep. I know you probably won't consider me worthy of a loan because, to be truthful, I'm not worthy of a loan. And I know you're probably going to say no. And in anticipation of you saying no, I'm already going to head towards the exit door. But just in case you might say yes, would you consider me for a loan? Yeah. That's not the way to get a loan. The way to get a loan is to say, Mr. Bank Manager. This is such a great deal. I'm buying it. I'm going to buy this property. The only thing I don't know is which bank is going to fund it. And quite frankly, I don't mind which bank it does because once the money's in my account, it doesn't really matter whether it came from this bank or the next bank or the next bank. Yep. But here's why it's a great deal. And then they're going to vie for your business. Mm. It's, a, it's a state of mind. It's your ability to communicate. With certainty. Yeah, right? with certainty. Yeah. So listen, folks, it's amazing. As I sit here and I listen to Dolph sharing with me as he's sharing with you all of these great Number one, Hacks, Insight, 23, uh, you know, author of 23 different books, been doing this for over 40 years. 
uh, presidents of countries call them relationship capital is unbelievable and his ability to really galvanize energy is incredible. I sit here and I'm saying, wait a minute, I know with a lot of our clients, we strategize when it comes to life insurance. You know, we use life insurance, if it's done properly, understanding it's a long-term mindset by overfunding cash value life insurance plans. And some of the folks like to buy residential real estate as an investment because in residential real estate, you get four different rates of return. You get cash flow, uh, mortgage interest write-off, depreciation. And obviously, if you bought a property today, you expect to sell it at a higher price later on. Mm -hmm. Now, for the entrepreneur out there that decides to overfund his cash value life insurance policy and builds it up and it's earning that guarantee rate of return by state law and by contract, now all of a sudden, if they buy that property and the property is 200000 they put $40,000 down, the renter pays back their policy. So they pick up four rates of return in the residential that we just talked about, plus dividends, interest, and, and the money being paid back to the policy. So it's about seven. What are some of the tax benefits that I'm not thinking of, if any, when it comes to commercial real estate and then rinse and repeat the same model by overfunding your life insurance policy as the down payment for your commercial? Well, the tax benefits- and you're not an accountant. Uh, we're neither, no one's here an accountant. We're just having an open conversation. Right. Yeah. The tax benefits on residential real estate are essentially identical to what they are on commercial, but the numbers can be bigger. So you get depreciation, and people don't realize this. You can have just about any other business other than real estate investing on this planet. And if you make, for instance, a $5,000 profit by having a flower shop or a bicycle repair shop or a laundromat or whatever, if you make a $5,000 cash profit after all your expenses, your cash expenses have been paid, then you can expect to pay tax on that $5,000. But if you own a piece of real estate and after all your cash expenses have been paid, like property taxes, insurance, maintenance, and you're left with $5,000 net cash income, you don't necessarily have to pay tax on that because it depends on something you mentioned, depreciation. Depreciation is a phantom deduction. Yep. The government is not so silly as to think land goes down in value. They know land goes up in value, but they are willing to assume that buildings go down in yes. value. How is that possible when you already said that in the last year, real estate in this country went up by 31% and the government thinks it goes down in value? And the answer to that is no, the government is not silly enough to think real estate goes down in value. But there are two reasons for taxation. Most people don't think about this, they don't realize it. One reason for taxation is revenue generation. The government provides certain services, border patrols or controls and issuing of passports and you name it, they need money for that. So they charge a tax to generate income. Yeah, the confiscatory hand of the government, taxation without representation. Right. right. And the slings and arrows against some inflation. Yes. The second reason for taxation is to shape social policy. Mm. So, for instance, they'll charge a higher tax on liquor and cigarettes than they do on other consumables to help you overcome your desire to be addicted to these things. <laughs> it's to reduce consumption. It's a disincentive. It's sort of having a hand in what they think is good or bad for you. And the government knows it's not very good at providing accommodation for people either residential or commercial. So it's willing to pretend that they go down in value by giving you a depreciation. It's a financial incentive yeah. for you to invest in real estate. So even though real estate goes up in value, you can take a tax write-off. Now, the way they do it is they say the useful life of a building is about 28 years. So they split that linearly and you can claim about 2.7 or whatever percent it is a year. So you can claim that against your income. So back to this 5,000 of net cash income, if you've got $6,000 of legitimate depreciation items, then even though you're making a $5,000 profit on paper, you're running at a loss. Minus the 6,000 leaves a loss of $1,000. Mm. And if you've got other income to offset that against, that means that the government will subsidize your other business. It's the wow. only activity I know of right throughout the Western world, because most countries have a form of depreciation, where the government will let you make a cash flow profit, but on paper you're running at a loss and they even give you money. And that loss would go against your earned income outside the income on your property as Correct. well? Correct. Is there, any other, um, is there any other besides straight line? Is there other type of amortizations? Oh, there are all kinds of things. It depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. Some have straight line. Some have diminishing value. So it could be um, you know, 2.5% straight line or 4% diminishing value. But there's also a thing known as accelerated depreciation. Mm. It's sometimes got the confusing term of cost segregation. And they say the useful life of a building in general is 20 28 years, but some items obviously wear out faster. Inside so, the building. 
anything that is not part of the physical structure of the building. Got it. So a wall is part of the physical yep. structure. You can't claim that. But if there's a non-load bearing wall, a partition, for instance, then it can be depreciated at a higher rate. So whenever wow. you buy a property, you should always, how often did I say? Always. always. You always. should always engage the services of what sometimes is called a cost segregation appraiser or a quantity surveyor, someone who is skilled and licensed to go and value the interior of the building. Wiring and plumbing in many jurisdictions can be claimed at 7.5%. And that may not sound like much, but it's three times the rate that you can claim the building at. And carpets in some jurisdictions, 40%. And some, 60%. Crockery and cutlery, 80%. Wow. First of all, so this is incredible. So, so on commercial real estate where it's much bigger, you're talking about the, the savings from a tax component are incredible, especially when it not only comes to the income from the real estate, but other income in other areas of your life. Absolutely. And if you do cost recovery, right, we call mm -hmm. it cost recovery. Does that mean like the furniture gets a different amortization schedule Correct. than the building itself? Right. It, it's depreciated at a different rate. Now, wow. some accountants say, Dolph, I don't see why you promote claiming accelerated depreciation because in case you don't realize, Dolph, when you sell that building, you, you have to recovery. pay what's paid depreciation recapture tax. Sometimes it's called depreciation recovered tax. And it's true, if you do sell it, you do have to pay tax on all the amounts that you depreciate because the assumption is you'll sell it for more money. Yeah. Right. Well, can I, can I play with that for a second? Just yeah. Just hold that thought. So, okay. So if you bought a property for a million, right? Yes. You eventually sold it for three million. Yes. But you, you, you had the cost recovery deduction from a million down to 200,000, let's okay. say. Okay. So you claimed 800,000. That's going to be recaptured ordinary income. Yes. And then the long-term growth would be between a million and three million. Correct. Yeah. You know what helps that out? By complementing it with cash value life insurance. When you make that the Batman and Robin or the Swiss Army knife of your overall planning when it comes to re residential and or commercial real estate, where you could take advantage of all these different amortization schedules that Dolph is talking about, what begins to happen is you compound your overall world, put more money back into your pocket where it belongs, and it has a rinse and repeat model that doesn't just always force you into 1031 exchanges. Go ahead. That's very true, but here's the, the clincher on it and the interesting thing. If you never sell the property, you never have to pay depreciation yes. recapture tax. Yes. And even if you do sell the property, aren't you getting hard today dollars from the government and you're only paying back soft future dollars? Ooh. Have you not just received an interest-free loan from the government Ooh. that you only have to pay back if you're stupid enough to sell the property? And I say stupid enough because I have yet to come up with a good compelling reason why anyone should ever sell a property. Yeah. In fact, I'll often be asked at a, in an event, there might be a thousand or two thousand people there, and someone will say, well, when do you sell the property? And I say, well, never. <laughs> My exit strategy used to be death, but that's too short term of thinking. I think we should bequeath the property and let someone else bequeath it. I've, I'll say to these people, give me one advantage of selling, one reason why you'd sell. Yeah. And the answer is well, so that you can put the money into a better deal. So let's say you've bought something for a million dollars and you can sell it for $3 million. Yep. They want to get that $2 million profit to put into another deal. And I say, well, hang on a minute. Let's think about this for a moment. So you bought it for a million, you're going to sell it for three million. Got to recap. Well, you're going to You've got to pay commission on it. If it's six percent commission on three hundred thousand on three million, that's one hundred and eighty thousand. Yep. That's number one. Number two, there are selling costs involved, escrow costs, and all that sort of thing. Then you pay capital gains tax on what is left. That it won't quite be two million because you've got selling commissions and whatnot. But you might have capital gains tax at 20% on another 1.5 million. That's a lot of money. So you might only end up with 1.3, 1.4 million of actual cash that you can spend on something. Whereas if you refinance that property, if you get an 80% mortgage on the 3 million, that's 2.4 million. Less the 80% of the, the 1 million you might have borrowed in the first place. And let's say you've paid interest only loans, you haven't made it off, there's 800,000. So 2.4 minus the 800,000, I'm struggling to do it, but that's 1.6 million. That's more money than you would have received had you sold the property and paid your commissions and capital gains tax. Yeah. And by not selling the building, you can buy the, the second building because you've right. got the 1.6 million, but you still own the first one. You've that's now right. got two going up in value. That's right. So I just can't think of a reason why you sell. There are some reasons. Yeah. I used to have a golden rule, which was never sell. Yeah. And I realized that was a bit too absolute because let's say you own a house or a commercial building in a town where there's only one industry. It's a steel mill. 
and the steel mill closes down and it employed 80% of the workers in that town and they've all now left to go elsewhere. The town is dying. At some point you're going to have to say, you know what, I should probably just sell this. So the rule changed from never sell to seldom sell. Mm. I know that sounds a bit of a tongue twister, but anyway, yeah. rarely sell, seldom sell. Um, and for the most part, people who sell tend to live to regret it. Mm. It's yeah. a very interesting thing. It's kind of instant gratification at that point. It's that instant was... gratification. Oh, we made a profit. Um, I've heard from so many people, I bought this property for 72000 and I can sell it for 240000 That's only a quarter of a million. They're all excited. Well, what was the point to sell it? So they could have the quarter million and spend it? or Make a profit, realize that the market might crash, the world might come to an end, market. all that stuff. Yeah. And then they realize that if they'd held on to it for another eight years, it would have gone for a million bucks mm. for no extra effort. And they would have had cash flow for that extra duration. Yeah. I, yeah. No, no. Listen, I think that's interesting. And, and I know that there's there's some folks that I know that heavy into real estate, right? But also have qualified money. Think of an IRA or 401k. And there's always that tax consequence on the IRA or 401k. So there's folks that I know, this is not a suggestion, just speaking openly right now, but they would take their real estate, not all of it. And let's say if their 401k is $2 million. And let's say they have $2 million of commercial real estate. They would put that into a charitable remainder trust. So once they're forced to take distributions on their 401k, the write-off from the charitable remainder trust offsets the income from the 401k. Mm -hmm. Great, great idea. Now, the question is, let's say if they get 20 years of income off of the charitable remainder trust that now owns the real estate, eventually what happens is the real estate's outside of the estate and it's outside the family. So... That might not be a good idea unless there's a wealth replacement trust in there vis-a-vis -vis life insurance that replaces the value of the real estate all tax rate. So these are strategies so not to sell the property, um, not to be able to you know have an estate tax liability that could be incredible later on in life because you know that you know when the next generation comes in, if there's not proper planning, sometimes the kids sell the real estate at a discount because they can't wait to get their hands on all the money. Right? That's right. They want a new car. Yeah. And yeah. there's strategies and communication for families that are out there. You have to be able to make sure that, you know, you're speaking to, to the estate attorney who's speaking to the insurance agent, who's speaking to the fiduciary, who's also speaking to the children with a true game plan on how to maximize that generational wealth. Because what you're talking about and what you're doing is creating massive wealth for families. And if it's done the right way, it could last 100 years if you structure things the right way. That's absolutely true. And that's why if there are any bits of information that people may have received that they didn't know about real estate, I'm happy to be sharing it. Yeah. But that's why they need to come to you to find out those little bits of information about how to structure things. Because even what you just mentioned, I didn't know all of that. Yeah. And I certainly don't have it in the tips of my finger. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, you should always seek out people who know more than you do. If you're the smartest person in the room, <laughs> the room's in trouble. You know, always hang with people who know more than you do, which is why I hang with you. That's a shirt. If you're the smartest person in the room, then the room's in trouble. Yep. I love that. No, it's so, Dal, for you, real fa thank you for showing up today. Oh, my God. You just totally had the, the information on this video is worth millions, right? Question I have, what does it look like for you for the next five or ten years? Where, where, where do, what are we looking for? What are, what are your goals? What are your objectives? Oh, gosh. You know, I'm, I'm quite a simple person at the end of the day. I believe if you can't put your head down on your pillow at night and say, today was such a blast and I'm looking forward to tomorrow, if you can't do that, then you should change what you're doing. Mm. And you can tell the lives people lead, I believe, by the looks on their faces. And it sounds a horrible thing to do, but we can't walk around town with our eyes shut, we trip over things. So you can't help but see people. And you have some come to and say, well, he or she looks really happy. Or that one looks a bit dour and that one's had a bad day. I wonder if he kicked the cat or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, the, 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 there's a lesson. That catch yourself in the mirror. Yeah. And if you think other people would think, oh, my gosh, he's having a miserable day, for heaven's sake, change what you're doing. Now, not everyone's in a position to be able to change what they're doing. But I suspect you can. If yeah. you wanted to take tomorrow off and go for a drive to wherever, you could. Yes. And I get the sense that you love what you do because you love empowering people. You love showing them a new way that they haven't thought of. Absolutely. That can change their financial future, not only for them, but for their kids and their kids' kids as well. That's right. So we're blessed in that sense, Rob, that we love what we do. And we, you know, I flew across the country and... No complaint at all, but I arrived at my hotel at three in the morning. The flight was delayed. It was a one and a half hour drive, two hour drive to get here. 
but it's still fun. Yeah. I've had a blast. Yeah. I've been to a place I haven't been before. I had a stunning view at breakfast time. I had a great breakfast. I get to hang with a whole bunch of people, not just you, but your whole team here yeah. is kind of happy. And yes. So what, what an adventure today has been. Yeah. And if you can make every day an adventure. You know, it's interesting because I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you. And, I, and since I've known you, I've one of the things, and this is for you out there, the entrepreneur. And, and let me just be very clear. If you want to... Um, become successful in anything you want to do. Success does leave clues. And being around folks that have been there, done that, is very magical. And what I notice about you, Dolph, in the time that I've known you, is you don't say no, and you show up. You literally don't say no, and you, don't, and you show up. And other people, and you come across, it's just like I do in life, there's always an excuse not to show up. And since I've met you, the ability to be committed to the outcome and to the process and to everything else. And by the way, have a long-term mindset, no instant gratification, be able to develop very good relationships through communication. I mean, you are like a five-star general in that space. It's well, incredible. It really is. I, I mean that. And I'm sitting here and I'm in awe as I, as I listen to Dolph speak. I'm sure many of you out there, when you hear the way he puts his words together, it's incredible. My question for you is what are some of the habits and rituals if any, or what does it look like on how you get yourself in state every day? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. And um, the first thing I would say is read more books. You know, reading is a lost art. We always say readers are leaders. He who does not read, I don't know why it's so gender specific. He who does not read has no advantage over he who cannot read. Mm. In other words, if you don't read, you may as well be illiterate. And not everyone on this planet can read and we're blessed with the ability to wow. read. Use it. Watch less TV. TV is just a scriptwriter's fantasy designed to get your attention long enough that you'll tolerate sitting through the ads, which are usually 10 decibels louder, yep. and has gotten to the point where ads are so frequently coming coming into program, it destroys your ability to enjoy the theme of the program because mm. it's just inundated with ads. So turn your TV off. In fact, if you want to do yourself a favor, take your TV and toss it out the window. Now, if you want to save some money, we're here about talking about how to make money and sure. how to save money. Open the window first. I don't care, but get rid of the TV because <laughs> no, I'm serious because it will rot the brain. Yeah, now, amazing. full disclosure, I have a TV, but I don't have a subscription to cable or satellite or anything. Amazing. People say, oh, did you see the episode of this or that? There was one, I, a Game of Thrones, for instance. Yes. So many people, love, I've never seen a single episode. I'm a bit embarrassed about it because I can't participate in those conversations. <laughs> but I tell you what, I've read books that they haven't even heard of that they don't know exist. And those books have changed my life. Yeah. Because here's the great thing about a book. It might cost you $30 to read a book, and it might take you three or four hours, or if you're a really slow reader, five or six hours, it doesn't matter, to consume that book. Mm. But in reading that book, you can absorb the essence of someone else's life. If it's a biography or an autobiography, in three hours, you can get a condensed version of everything they went through. It can change who you are. Wow. wow. And every successful person on this planet <clears throat> vows and attests to the fact that by reading books, it changed who they were. Amazing. So like when you think of like the entrepreneur that is always successful, that is constantly just consistently hitting the marks, mm -hmm. right? And by the way, life has its ups and downs. Not everything is a yes. There's, there's challenges that come for you, right? Because once again, you're always showing up. Your information is powerful. Your results speak for themselves. Your, you know, your, your track record of what you've done around the world has been incredible. Your 23 books, everything that you can think of under the sun is all present. Is there times that you have to invoke into some nervous system strategies if you don't feel like doing something? And how do you overcome that? Because I think a lot of folks are always three feet from gold, and sometimes they don't realize how close they are. And how does that play into your world, if at any point in your past or even to this day when it comes to momentum? Um, you're very right. It does happen that way where, you know, everyone, myself included, you get to the point sometimes you think, is this really worth it? Yes. You're putting in all this effort and you're not seeing the results. Yeah. And the truth is, we don't know when the results are going to come through. There's no linear relationship or one-on-one -on -one relationship between effort put in and results that come out. You might put effort in for two days and get results on day three, and that seems like a good trade-off you know, depending on what you're doing. But sure. sometimes you're working on something for two years before it comes through. I've written a book, you know, I, I've written every word of every book I've done. I've never had a ghostwriter. I'm not saying that makes me better than those who have a ghostwriter. In fact, those with ghostwriters are probably smarter because they didn't waste months of their lives writing the books, right? <laughs> but for whatever reason, I've written every word of every book myself. Sometimes I can 
you know, get a book done in two or three months. And other times it will take a year or two, part-time work, not full-time. Nope. Um, but you keep on persevering. And as long as you write one page a day, eventually you'll have a book. Mm. And then once you know what it's like having a book that's actually published by a big mainstream publisher, there's no going back because you get feedback from people that it actually changed their lives. Mm. And one of the biggest thrills I get, and it still happens almost on a daily basis, is someone will send an email or write a note or, or DM you on some social media and say, you know, when I met you, this was my situation. In fact, my wife was about to leave me because, you know, we wow. weren't making enough money, et cetera, et cetera. And then I read your book and I didn't even believe in them, but I thought I'd give it a go. What do I have to lose? And now I own four properties. I'm about to close on my fifth. I quit my job two months ago and I couldn't be happier. And I just want to thank you. You don't know this person. You'll probably never meet them. The fact that you change someone else or some living being on this planet, you change their life forever. That's a thrill that you can't describe what it feels like. And that's what motivates me. Wow. So it sounds like to me as, as um, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you divorce yourself from the outcome. Mm -hmm. You don't put a timetable on the outcome and you're here to make the world a better place by serving others. Right. Growth and contribution. Even if it's just one person at a time. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Dolph, you are without a doubt one of the most entertaining, educated, um, philosophical and proof of, of 23 books and everything else you've done interview that I've ever had in my life. Oh, that's pretty this, kind of you I don't just, say. if you watch my videos, I don't say that. You wow. know what I mean? So I'm on it. This thank was you. an incredible, incredible, incredible opportunity for me. I can't thank you enough. And uh, I look forward well, to some more It's my absolute pleasure. And uh, for all the folks out there, how can they once again find you? TikTok. Uh, um, you know, the best well way is link. TikTok, king of commercial real estate. Um, I'm on Instagram under the same name. I've got a rare name. That's both a blessing and a curse. So you can't really search me without finding me pretty easily. Dolph DeRoos. That Dolph DeRoos. Just search Dolph. I'm on Audible. I'm on Amazon. You name it. So yes. just search the word Dolph. It rhymes with golf. <laughs> Dolph rhymes with golf. And it's very user friendly if you want to be able to get access to his free book. You just follow. Click here. Click that. And just follow the link and everything else. And you'll be able to get a free book. And, and maybe even get into a position where you have a conversation with him about real estate. So Dolph, thank you so much for being on my program today. And listen, for all you folks out there, the amount of information that has been given in this last 30 some odd minutes is incredible. Take it, sit down, rewind it back, listen to it, take notes. If you have questions, there's questions you can add in the comment section below. If you want to reach out to Dolph, you can go check him out on TikTok and or Instagram under Dolph DeRoos, King of Commercial. There is access to him through those channels. And once again, if there's other information you want us to talk about in the future, please put that in the comment section below. And don't forget to click the link. One of the members of the Epic team will definitely reach out to you if you have any questions. Once again, Dolph, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.